uh, the discussion on international environmental agreements, um, the basic cost benefit analysis, the basic differences between uh, cooperative and non cooperative games, talked about free riding, talked about cartel formation, and I started uh, the discussion on uh, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. <coughs> Where the last thing I showed is that the UNFCCC was indeed successful in getting people talking uh, about um, climate policy. Um, from the uh, beginning, the aim of the UNFCCC has always been to establish legally binding uh, targets and timetables uh, for emission reductions. So essentially, the goal was uh, to all get together and say we're going to cut emissions by 10% or 20% uh, or uh, whatever. <coughs> um, Sorry, can I take one chair? Because we don't yes, have you can take many as many as you want. Um, <laughs> I'll open the door. Okay. In the, the, the very first um, negotiations in Berlin in 2005, uh, uh, there was actually almost uh, an agreement on this. Um, and then they needed a bit of, bit of breathing space in 1996. Uh, and then in 1997, uh, the Kyoto Protocol uh, was negotiated. And the Kyoto Protocol consists of two substantial parts. One is there were targets for emission reduction. Um, for instance, Europe got uh, minus eight, uh, so Europe agreed to reduce uh, its emissions by 2012 uh, to 92% uh, of the 1990 levels. Um, and there was a deal on international policy instruments where essentially richer countries could invest in greenhouse gas emission reduction in poorer countries, in countries that did not have uh, targets, as well as uh, in countries that did have targets. It also established that uh, international trade is possible in emission permits between uh, rich countries. Um, <clears throat> the thing that attracted most attention, um, the thing that I'm going to talk about most, are the emission reduction targets. Uh, so the Kyoto Protocol uh, set uh, those targets for essentially the rich countries. Uh, There's a bit of disagreement about who was included, particularly with regard to South Korea, Turkey, uh, and Mexico, whether or not they would be considered rich. Um, but for Europe, uh, North America, Australia, New Zealand, and Japan, uh, they definitely were targets. Um, unfortunately, the Kyoto Protocol did not specify. Um, how emissions would be defined, uh, particularly with regard to the measurements of uh, CO2 emissions from land use. Uh, there's quite a bit of uh, wrangling uh, that was going on at the time and is still uh, continuing about how, what is actually an emission. Uh, <clears throat> it's of course, creates a bit of a problem if you want to reduce something and you're not quite sure what it is you want to reduce. Um, Kyoto Protocol also did not specify, um, I mean, it said you can use these um, international flexibility instruments, for instance, the clean development mechanism uh, or uh, permit trade uh, between countries. Those sort of actions are allowed, but there is a limit to uh, how much they can contribute to your emission reduction obligations. Uh, but that limit was unspecified in Kyoto. Um, and also one thing that the Kyoto Protocol did not specify is what would happen if a country that had targets and missed uh, those targets, what the sanctions uh, would be. Um, <coughs> so in that sense, the Kyoto Protocol uh, was rather empty. There were headline numbers uh, that were splashed all over the media, but if you started prodding what would those headline numbers actually mean, uh, it was uh, particularly uh, unclear or undefined. Um, 
Then there was a, a period of uh, renegotiation or filling in the details of the Kyoto Protocol. Um, two significant uh, things that happened uh, during that period in the 1996 negotiation, or sorry, in the 1998 negotiations in the Hague. Um, something happened that we now actually seem uh, strange. Um, Al Gore was there on behalf uh, of the uh, United States. This was back in the days uh, that he was vice president rather than a campaigner. Um, and he was sitting there waiting to do a deal with Europe. Uh, but Europe wasn't ready. Um, <clears throat> if you read the story afterwards, uh, what happens uh, then, the Germans blame the Brits, the Brits blame the French, and the French blame the Germans. Essentially, the three, at that time, the three main countries in Europe uh, could not agree with one another about what to tell uh, Al Gore. Uh, and he was just sitting there twiddling his thumbs, uh, and essentially nothing happened. Um, <clears throat> this was a missed opportunity, because this was the last time um, that the Gore Clinton uh, administration was at these negotiations. A little bit later, uh, Gore was replaced by uh, Bush Jr. Um, and that, of course, changed the attitudes of the United States towards these international uh, negotiations quite considerably. Um, so, this was sort of the a, a, a clearly missed opportunity. Um, <clears throat> the Europeans have learned from uh, the experience in The Hague, uh, but perhaps not in the way um, you would hope uh, or would think uh, they would. Uh, essentially, the Europeans went into The Hague without a predefined position. They thought we're going to sort it out while we are there. Uh, and then uh, it turned out that they could not agree with one another. And ever since, the EU position in international negotiations is pre-negotiated in Brussels. Um, which is perfectly fine. I mean, the US also goes in with a pre-negotiated uh, position, the same as for true for China and for India. Uh, but whereas these countries do this behind closed doors, the EU, of course, cannot do this behind closed doors because they're also uh, accountable to the national parliaments uh, and to uh, the national electorates. Um, which means that ever since uh, 1998, um, the European position in the international climate negotiations is announced uh, three to six months ahead of the negotiations. But essentially, it is known what the Europeans will say. It is known how the Europeans will respond to a counteroffer from uh, China or the US, um, and everything is in the public domain, uh, essentially. So uh, anybody who is interested in these climate negotiations uh, can look up uh, at least three months, but often six months in advance, what the Europeans will say. Um, <coughs> which creates a unified position of the European Union, uh, but at the same time there's nothing to negotiate. The Europeans essentially put their cards on the table and uh, that's it. And the real negotiations are going on between other countries uh, rather than between uh, Europe uh, and the rest. Um, so that is uh, something that results immediately from the shambles uh, in uh, The Hague. Um, <coughs> Or still with Kyoto, right? When I <laughs> sort of diverted. And in 2000, uh, uh, during the negoci negotiations in Marrakesh, uh, a deal was reached. Uh, the details of the Kyoto Protocol uh, were added. Um, essentially, the measurement of emissions was rather generous uh, in the sense that uh, carbon dioxide that's being taken up by uh, the regrowth of vegetation is counted uh, more than some people would have liked, and this particularly benefited Russia. Um, 
the deal was, was reached on how, uh, to what extent these international flexibility instruments could be used, and essentially no limits uh, were imposed. Um, <clears throat> and also were, the deal was reached on enforcement, what happens if you miss your target. Um, and essentially the deal that was done was that if a country misses its targets in 2012, um, then in 2020, say, it would have to do, uh, I believe, 30% more than it otherwise would have done. That sounds strange, this 30% penalty. But because their targets for 2020 were not negotiated at the time, still have not been negotiated, it's an empty gesture. Essentially what it said, if you miss your target, you have to work harder, but having to work harder is relative to how much you would have worked and how much you would have worked is undefined. So essentially no uh, <coughs> penalties uh, were, um, were agreed or would have been imposed. And then for some countries uh, that felt that all of this was not enough, and uh, their initial reduction targets were essentially relaxed. Um, <clears throat> now, then the international climate negotiations essentially went into a period of a, a lull. Uh, the were targets, there were the Kyoto Americas Accords, uh, there was some fine tuning going on, nothing else happened. Um, Kyoto Protocol had a clause in place that only if at least 55% uh, of the countries uh, representing at least 55% of emissions would sign up, then the Kyoto Protocol would uh, enter into force. So for a long time, the uh, negotiations were really about how to get Russia to ratify the Kyoto Protocol. Um, and that took a lot of wrangling. There was a lot of things going on behind the scenes uh, but in the end, the European Union offered greater bribes uh, than the United States this did. At this stage in international climate policy, um, the Bush-Cheney uh, administration had completely changed uh, its tune. If you look back at the original, uh, or the, <coughs> the first election campaign of Bush Jr., he promised uh, carbon taxes. Uh, he promised actually uh, a climate policy that was about as advanced, perhaps a bit smarter even than uh, Al Gore, his main uh, opponent uh, at the time. Uh, but by the time we sort of are in the second term of the Bush Cheney administration, they were dead against anything to do with climate policy, uh, which most people attribute uh, to Cheney rather than to Bush. Um, and at this stage, uh, the United States was actively trying to undermine uh, the international climate uh, negotiations. Uh, that changed as soon as uh, they were replaced by uh, Obama, <coughs> and it became a bit more uh, constructive. Not a lot more constructive, <laughs> but a bit more uh, constructive. Um, Kyoto targets were for the period 2008-2012. And we talked about this when we discussed uh, tradable permits, that the target for a year may not be uh, particularly smart. It's because of the natural variability in emissions uh, due to weather, due to uh, unexpected events, and so on and so forth. Uh, so the targets were smeared out over five year periods, and what matters was the average emissions of total emissions during that period. And that, of course, takes away a lot of that variability. Um, <clears throat> so the Kyoto targets. Um, are by now irrelevant, right? They're in the past. Europe has met its target mostly, be target mostly because of the recession. Um, other countries that originally signed up, such as Canada, realized that it would not meet their targets and basically left the treaty. Um, and you might think that the Kyoto Protocol uh, is now irrelevant, uh, but there's actually no sunset clause in the Kyoto Protocol at all. The targets were for a specific date, but the other things that were agreed in Kyoto, particularly the international flexibility uh, instruments, uh, clean development mechanism, 
tradable permits between OECD countries. Um, those things are still valid. That did not expire and that is still part of uh, international uh, law. Um, <clears throat> when people began, when people sort of realized that the emission reduction targets were only valid until 2012, um, they started negotiating the next, uh, what is known as commitment period, uh, aiming uh, for the period 2013 to 2020 was uh, the original uh, idea. Um, and this has been um, a bit of a farce, really. Uh, there's been a series of agreements about agreements. Um, and the first one was uh, agreed in Bali in 2007, where essentially uh, all the countries came together uh, and solemnly pledged to reach an agreement in 2009. Uh, that was uh, the Copenhagen um, conference, which essentially collapsed. Uh, it was so in, in uh, the months prior to uh, these negotiations expectations were exceedingly high um, and they really thought they could reach a deal uh, and as because of that a lot of uh, senior politicians went to Copenhagen to reach this deal uh, so Sarkozy was there, Merkel was there, Obama was there um, Gordon Brown was there, right? Um, and essentially it turned out that there, the pre-negotiations and what the diplomats had done in preparation wasn't good enough. And when push came to shove, uh, they could not agree on what the emission reduction targets uh, should be, or what the eventual um, the eventual aims uh, should be at what level concentration should be stabilized and so on and so forth. Um, at a certain point Obama went off uh, with a couple of what he thought were like-minded uh, countries, South Africa, Brazil, uh, India and China, and negotiated a, a separate deal that did not have the force of law and the other countries uh, very quickly abandoned him and then the uh, Europeans got very upset. Um, <coughs> because they were not in the room, because they had nothing to say, right? Why would you invite uh, the Europeans? Um, and essentially, um, despite the high expectations, uh, it completely collapsed. Uh, there were two, two uh, implications. Uh, one, there was an enormous backlash against. Uh, um, depending on your political position, whether or not uh, the deal that was on the table or wasn't on the table was a good thing or a bad thing. A lot of people uh, got very upset with what was going on. Um, but there is a second thing uh, that happens. If you send the prime minister to international negotiations and he comes back empty-handed, and it was not just that they had agreed on a vacuous statement, that they had some sort of communique that says we've been good boys and girls. Um, yes, it came back empty hand that they could not even agree on a final uh, <laughs> final text. Um, if a senior politician goes somewhere and comes back empty handed, then that is a major embarrassment. And there is nothing that politicians hate as much as being embarrassed than going, investing a week uh, of their time into something and then not coming up with even a fig leaf. Um, <clears throat> as a result, the political leaders that were there uh, had never been spotted in international climate negotiations ever again. Right? And the same is true uh, for their successors. Right? Uh, so Merkel has not been back, Obama has not been back, um, but also Hollande has not been there, Cameron has not been there because they saw what happened to Sarkozy, they saw what happened to Brown. Um, collapse was not total. A year later in Cancun, 
Uh, there was an agreement to keep trying to come back. That was the major outcome of two week negotiations. We will come back next year, and that was seen as a breakthrough. Um, and then there were agreements uh, in 2011 and in 2012 to reach an agreement uh, in 2015 in Paris. Um, which is at the end of the year, we don't know what's going to happen. Um, in between, there were the 2014 uh, negotiations in Lima, it was December last. Um, I actually think that something significant happened in Lima. Uh, I seem to be the only one uh, who thinks this. Um, and what happened in Lima is that uh, an ugly mouthful uh, was introduced, uh, so-called intended nationally determined contributions. So <laughs> failing to make any progress on legally binding targets, uh, essentially at the end of the conference, the chairman uh, turned around and said, why don't you tell us what you intend to do anyway in terms of emission reductions? And every country was essentially asked to volunteer their plans. Um, and if they had no plans, then they could volunteer that they had no plans. Um, and essentially, this completely turns around the negotiations where the initial intention was to jointly agree on joint emission reduction targets that were, legal, that were binding in international law um, that is a cooperative solution which we know won't work uh, in Lima they actually turned around and said why don't you tell us what you were doing planning to do anyway and <clears throat> Presumably those plans would be rooted in whatever the national process is for deciding such things. Um, and we're just going to look at them and see whether it's enough or whether we can do more or whether we can help uh, people. Well, essentially it turns into a plans and review uh, type of uh, negotiations. Um, there's a couple of advantages of plans and review. One is that if indeed the outcome of a negotiation is a binding targets, then if you're a rational actor and you don't quite know what is going to come out of that, then you would go in with a rather conservative position, because you may be held to your word. Um, but if you're just going to make a promise, but the promise doesn't have any consequences uh, in any legal terms, then you can speak much more, uh, more freely. So on a plan and review uh, system, you would expect more ambitious and ambitious announcements to be made. Um, Plans and review is of course also how the international community provides other public goods. For instance, if you look at uh, peacekeeping, essentially they organize an international conference and then they go around the table and ask how many troops will you send and how many money will you contribute, right? If you look at uh, a response to um, uh, 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 a serious epidemic or even a pandemic, then the WHO calls a conference and says how much doctors will you send and how much tents uh, will you contribute, right? That's how they do it. That's how we provide um, global public goods. And those problems are in principle in the same sort of structure uh, as greenhouse gas emission reduction. So and these programs actually work, not perfectly, uh, definitely not perfectly, but at least they work a little bit. And it now seems that uh, the international climate negotiations are moving uh, into that uh, direction. It's only 10 years or so since uh, Dave Bradford of Princeton said, perhaps we should be trying this. Um, talked a little bit about Paris, right? Um, <clears throat> there's still a lot of people out there uh, who hope that Paris will be the breakthrough that Copenhagen wasn't, that 
the auto wasn't, um, where uh, a legally binding uh, treaty will be uh, negotiated with uh, top targets for 2020 uh, and beyond. Um, I think that is exceedingly unlikely. Um, I think the most likely outcome will be that there will be some sort of weak treaty because people have learned from Copenhagen, but it may actually be that uh, Paris will collapse uh, as Copenhagen did. Um, as I said, the EU is not a negotiation, uh, negotiation partner uh, at all. It's basically disqualified itself uh, in the, since The Hague. Um, and in the EU nowadays, there's also a lot of resentment and resistance against more stringent uh, climate policy, including in the traditionally green countries like uh, the UK, like the Netherlands, like uh, Germany. Um, <clears throat> I won't talk much about uh, US politics. Uh, Obama would like a treaty, um, but the US Constitution says that uh, this is actually not within the power of the president to negotiate an international treaty. This is within the power of the Senate uh, in particular, uh, and the Senate is not going to play uh, with Obama. Um, and by then, he, he will have uh, 10 months or so to run in his presidency anyway. So he'll, he'll be a bit of a lame duck. Uh, so don't expect uh, fireworks from the Americans. Um, the new Prime Minister of India, uh, Modi, has made it very clear that climate is not uh, on his agenda. Uh, the Chinese are actually keen on climate policy because <clears throat> essentially China is a desert. There's very little rain that falls over China. China is basically fed by uh, big rivers that come from the Tibetan Plateau. Um, and there are some climate models, including the climate model developed by the Chinese themselves, that show that climate change would essentially stop the rains of the Tibetan Plateau, which would mean that all the major rivers in China would dry up, and China would turn into a proper desert. Um, and because of that, China actually sees itself as very vulnerable to climate change. Whether or not this is true is a different story, and uh, time will tell. Uh, but this is definitely the story you hear in China. Um, but even though the Chinese are interested in pursuing climate policy, they're not at all interested in tying their hands through an international treaty. If they're going to reduce emissions, then they're going to do it under their own steam for their own reasons, not because an international treaty uh, tells them to. Uh, so for those reasons, <coughs> I don't expect much uh, from Paris. Uh, but there's a lot of people out there uh, who are getting very, very excited um, about what will happen in the last week of November and the first week of December uh, of this year, the capital of France. Um, <clears throat> so where are we? Um, basic game theory, more advanced game theory, the same story. Essentially predicted that it will be hard to negotiate an international treaty on greenhouse gas emission reduction because it is a global public good. Um, and indeed, in the last 20 years of international negotiations, and this Paris will be the, tw the 21st, so it should say 20 years, um, um, have essentially left to nothing much. There's no substantial treaty, and emissions haven't really budged. Now, I hear you think, um, what about acidification, and what about uh, the uh, hole in the ozone layer? Um, where we do have examples of successfully negotiated international treaties on uh, emission reduction. Uh, so let's start with acidifying uh, gases. Um, <clears throat> acid rain is perhaps not something uh, that you guys uh, know about, right? Uh, it's a problem that I've solved uh, uh, a while ago. Essentially, when you burn uh, impure coal, um, then the sulfur in there and the sulfur gets into the atmosphere, uh, stays up in the atmosphere for up to two weeks, and then when it rains down or 
get deposited in some other way. There's also dry deposition. It's not just uh, wet deposition. Um, and essentially damages vegetation. It also creates smog, uh, but it also directly uh, interferes with uh, fish and with trees and those sort of things. It was a big problem in the 70s and 80s. Um, in the late 80s, countries of Western Europe came together, and it, it is because the acid stuff stays in the atmosphere for about two weeks, it can cross a continent. It won't make it all the way around the world, just a tiny little uh, bit would, but it does cross uh, international borders. This is not a problem that is created in London and suffered in London. This is a problem uh, that is created in one country and suffered uh, in the country down the way. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, countries recognize this, or European countries recognize this to be a problem, um, and quickly uh, reach an agreement that emissions would be cut uh, by uh, 30%. Uh, um, and that initial agreement uh, was rapidly succeeded uh, by a, a much more stringent deal. Uh, it's more stringent in two ways that A, Eastern Europe uh, was included uh, in the deal and second, uh, rather than cutting emissions, there was actually agreement uh, to cut, or cut emissions by a little bit, there was actually an agreement to cut emissions uh, very uh, substantially. You may wonder why, right? And these treaties have actually been a success. If you look at, uh, <coughs> if you look at the emissions of acidifying gases or the deposition uh, of acidifying substances, then you indeed find uh, that emissions nowadays are a fraction of what they used to be. And we're talking about uh, <coughs> emission reductions in the order of 18, 90%. Um, so a big success, and you may wonder why, right? Because there is a strong continental public goods element uh, to this. If uh, the UK reduces its emissions, it's not the UK who will benefit, but it's uh, Netherlands and Belgium, the countries downwind that will benefit uh, from this. If Poland reduces its emissions, the benefits will fall on Germany rather than on Poland itself. Um, <coughs> there are actually structural reasons why uh, this worked. Um, an important source of these acidifying gases uh, is road traffic. Um, road traffic also creates other uh, environmental problems, particularly uh, urban air pollution. And it just so happens that if you want to go after the local environmental problem, urban air quality, then as a result, you're also going to reduce your acidifying gases. It's just the two are technically uh, coupled. Uh, so essentially, a lot of the impetus for solving the continental problem were local concerns. <coughs> um, secondly, uh, we are talking about uh, the late 80s, the early 90s. Uh, an important source of acidifying gases was power generation. At that time, Power plants were not privately owned as they are now, but they were operated by state-owned monopolies or sometimes semi-state uh, monopolies, which meant that they did not care about their cost base at all, right? They could just pass the increased cost of whatever it took to clean up uh, their emissions to the customer. There was no competition going on uh, at all. So they basically didn't care. Uh, much uh, about those things. <clears throat> there was a very strong public demand for solving this problem. Um, at that time, uh, a new word uh, entered uh, the English language, Waldsterben. Um, and essentially, the Germans were afraid that because of acid rain, all their trees would die. And there was a lot of empirical evidence that trees were indeed dying. <coughs> um, and the German psyche is basically attached uh, to uh, the German forest. And the idea of the black forest dying uh, was too much for Germans to take. It was a very strong uh, demand. Um, 
that's actually not the meaning of Walt, Walt Stamp at all in, in English. And later on, it turned out that the trees were not dying because of acid deposition, but they were trying, dying because of drought. And Walt Stamp in English is now used as strong public demand, but misguided public demand. Um, <laughs> So that drove a lot of action, um, and in order to take sulfur out of uh, power plants, you essentially need to apply a filter, essentially an end of life solution that will drive up the cost by electricity by 10, perhaps 20%. It's not exceedingly expensive. Uh, another thing that was going on, as I said, sulfur comes mainly out of coal, uh, thanks to the efforts uh, of Mrs. Thatcher and Mr. Lawson, uh, the big bogeyman uh, of the climate movement. Um, Coal was essentially being phased out. So uh, the Thatcher uh, Lawson uh, government did a few things, right? They closed the coal mines, and uh, they also set the electricity sector free, liberalization. Um, and as soon as these uh, entities started operating on a commercial basis, they ditched coal and went for gas, which was a lot cheaper. That is why they did it. It also turned out to be a lot cleaner uh, than the coal uh, they were burning. Uh, and last but certainly not least, <coughs> the Berlin Wall came down and the economies of Eastern Europe essentially collapsed and with that all the heavy industry that was burning so much coal uh, disappeared. And that took the emissions uh, with them. <coughs> so none of this suggests that there was a strong international environmental agreement to reduce sulfur emissions. Right? A lot of the emission reduction happened for other reasons than the international environmental uh, agreement. Um, ozone is a bit different. Um, there's a layer uh, of ozone about, about 10 kilometers uh, above our head. Um, and essentially what that does is it filters out uh, UV uh, ultraviolet radiation. If you're hit by ultraviolet radiation, uh, then you develop skin cancer, there's DNA damage. Uh, what is true for humans is also true for uh, a lot of other uh, species. Um, and we're very fortunate uh, to have all that uh, ozone above our head because essentially it filters out all the bad radiation uh, from the sun. Um, <clears throat> now, Chlorofluorocarbons, CFCs, uh, are used as refrigerants. They were invented in the late 40s, early 50s. Initially, people thought this was the most brilliant uh, invention uh, since sliced bread. The reason is that we, the CFCs are completely inert. They can be used as a refrigerant, as a way to cool stuff, uh, but they don't do anything else. Um, this implies that if you have a fridge in your home, that is cooled with CFCs, you don't have to, every two weeks, replace the coolant in your fridge or take your fridge to the shop to have the uh, coolant replaced, which is very handy because fridges are uh, heavy, right? So that's actually a good thing. CFCs were also used as propellants and deodorant and those other things used to come in cans that you could spray. Um, and the good thing about CFCs is that they're inert. so they don't affect the shelf life of the uh, deodorants and things like that. Simply don't respond uh, to anything. Or so people thought, um, uh, because the initial assessment was that CFCs were completely inert, nobody paid attention to them, right? You could just bend them into the atmosphere because they were harmless, they did not react to anything anyway, uh, or so they thought. Um, but it actually turns out that if they get high enough up in the atmosphere, then they start uh, responding to uh, light, and they actually start uh, uh, taking down the ozone in the ozone layer uh, in a catalytic, um, catalytic uh, reaction. So one CFC atom can take out about 10,000 uh, ozone atoms, um, molecules, molecules, molecules. Um, 
Now, this was first not believed, um, then um, scientific evidence uh, sort of came in. In 1985, there was political uh, agreement uh, that this was indeed a serious issue. Um, and in 1988, three years later, so three years after the problem sort of was on the international uh, agenda, uh, the Montreal Protocol was negotiated. Um, and essentially, in the initial protocol, only 24 uh, countries took part. Notice the difference with climate, right? In Montreal, the starting point was let's negotiate with like minded countries first and then expand. In climate, everybody was around the table from the very start. Um, so, uh, 24 countries agreed to eventually phase out production and consumption, uh, and then the Montreal Protocol has been amended five times, and every time it was amended, more countries joined, and the targets were made more stringent. Uh, so, a resounding uh, success, and as of 2001, um, 14 years ago, um, the production and consumption of CFCs is essentially forbidden, and um, the hole in the ozone layer uh, that is there is very gently and gradually uh, closing. Um, <clears throat> now, you may wonder how can this be, right? Because we're now talking uh, again about a not a continental public good, like I said, rain, but about a global public good, like climate. So how can it be that countries get together uh, and reach a global deal to phase out uh, these substances. Well, as with uh, acid rain, it was a very strong public demand. Um, Ultraviolet radiation causes cancer. People get very scared when anything causes cancer. Uh, there was an EPA report that showed that uh, 100 million people would die due to cancer, that was over the century and over the whole world, but the media sort of reported that as 100 million um, Americans next year. Uh, so there was a lot of public fear and a lot of uh, cry uh, out for uh, strong action. Uh, but still, if you sort of read the accounts of the run-up to the Montreal Protocol, there were a lot of people very pessimistic about, as pessimistic as I am now about Paris, right? It's a global public good. Uh, we're not going to reach an agreement. Um, <clears throat> and that was true for the first week of Montreal. You know, these negotiations typically take two weeks. And the first week there was a lot of uh, polite uh, talk, but no uh, action that continued uh, into the first two days. Um, of the second week, and on the, then on the Wednesday night, something happened. And what happened was that the CEO of DuPont called the White House and said, Rome, we solved the problem. Now you negotiate a deal. And what happened was that Rome, being um, Reagan, of course, um, called the negotiators in Montreal. And overnight, the American delegation completely changed position from being very hesitant to agree on anything to arguing for very stringent uh, targets. Uh, the Europeans and the Japanese were so embarrassed by this and so surprised by this that they just signed up. And the reason that DuPont called the White House um, was as follows. And the may be a bit strange because DuPont is actually one of, was one of the big manufacturers of CFCs and the Montreal Protocol essentially phased out CFCs, so why would the CEO uh, want to, uh, of a company want to phase out uh, his own product? <clears throat> reason for that is that that week DuPont had a technological breakthrough. They discovered how to make HFCs, hydrofluorocarbons. 
It are almost as good uh, as a refrigerant and a propellant and all those sort of things as CFC, slightly more expensive. Um, and the reason that DuPont wanted this was because they believed, correctly so, that they were the only company who knew how to make HFCs. Well, they hadn't quite figured out how to do it. The Japanese hadn't quite figured out how to do it. Essentially, what Montreal did was it said, you can't use CFCs anymore. You must use HFCs. And DuPont was the only company in the world who knew how to make HFCs. So essentially, the Montreal Protocol handed a monopoly, a temporary monopoly. The other companies, the other chemical companies, sorted it out uh, soon enough. But it handed um, a big competitive advantage to uh, this uh, particular company. So that is why uh, the Americans uh, signed uh, up. <coughs> Still haven't explained why other uh, countries uh, signed up. Uh, I will get to that. One of the crucial bits of the Montreal Protocol is that it includes trade sanctions. Now, uh, trade sanctions are always a bit iffy uh, under uh, WTO um, rule. Uh, but in this case, um, The trade sanctions were essentially export bans. And the WTO has never considered that an export ban may be beneficial uh, to a country, so they never banned export bans. Um, <coughs> and these trade sanctions are the only enforcement mechanism in the Montreal Protocol. Uh, essentially, what it says is that if you sign up to uh, the Montreal Protocol, and, uh, there's a lot of legal text on the next slide that I'll skip through. Um, essentially, it says if you sign up to the Montreal Protocol, you can no longer export CFCs to countries that have not signed up. You can still trade within the countries that have signed up. They actually agree to phase them out. Uh, but you can no longer export uh, to other countries. Um, <clears throat> so essentially, countries that do not sign up to the Montreal Protocol have two choices, right? Either they have to go without CFCs, or they have to make them in-house domestically. Now, for small countries, um, that is simple, right? Uh, see, making CFCs is not very difficult. Anybody with a degree in chemical engineering would know how to make CFCs, but you need to make them at scale. There's large economies of scale there. <coughs> So for small countries that do not have a domestic supply of CFCs, the choice is really between signing up to the Montreal Protocol and being allowed to buy CFCs for a little while longer while you're introducing HFCs, or build up your own industry, but because of uh, lacking economies of scale, that would be very expensive. So for small countries, uh, the choice was actually very simple. Uh, you have to sign up to the Montreal Protocol. Um, <clears throat> Big countries, it's a different story. Sorry, do you only buy HFCs if you signed up? If you sign up, you, you, if you sign up, you can still buy CFCs for a while longer until 20, oh, um, 2001. Excellent. What if you haven't signed up? Can you buy HFCs? Yes. Okay. You can always buy HFCs. Um, <laughs> big countries, of course, do have the economies of scale. Now, why did India sign up to the Montreal Protocol? Essentially, it got promised a lot of technological support. It got access to patents it would otherwise not have had access to. Um, <laughs> China, similar uh, story. Uh, the deal with China was very simple. If you want to join the World Trade Organization, you have to join the Montreal Protocol. And essentially, there was a veto on China joining the WTO uh, uh, unless they signed uh, up to Montreal. And China reckons that the costs of joining Montreal was smaller than the benefit of joining uh, the World Trade Organization. And that's why uh, China uh, signed up. Um, 
The big exporters, of course, as I said, uh, for the US, the choice was also simple. Either you go for the uh, CFCs that are sort of low margin, or you go for the, uh, the new monopoly HFCs. Uh, so that was simple. Uh, as I said, the Japanese and the Europeans <laughs> essentially fooled by the Americans. Uh, so they uh, signed up to something that they did not quite know the consequences of. Um, <clears throat> But of course, the Europeans could hide behind the fact that CFCs cause cancer, uh, and that would sort of like justify uh, strong uh, environmental action. Right? So that is why Montreal uh, worked. How does this apply to climates? Well, these were different environmental uh, problems. Um, there's some parallels with the climate negotiations, strong public demand. Uh, is the biggest one, um, but the availability of a cheap alternative, in the case of acid rain, just putting filters on your smokestacks, uh, or changing from dirty diesel to cleaner diesel, uh, or for ozone, switching from CFCs to HFCs, that's not really an option for climate. There's no silver bullet, no single technology or a small set of technologies that can solve the problems, and they're definitely not cheap. Um, so this parallel doesn't hold. Um, for acid rain, the main reason that this is uh, disappearing in Europe uh, is that emissions are cut for other reasons, and this would not hold. Uh, with the ozone layer, <coughs> simply for this to work, for climate, what we would need to have is not the bomb turning around, but it is the Saudis and the Russians turning around and say, don't buy our oil, don't buy our gas, buy our solar and wind instead. That would be the equivalent transition, um, which is hard to imagine uh, and that any of these countries would ever uh, change uh, <coughs> in that uh, way anytime soon. Right? Um, so yes, there's two examples of successfully, negoti and successfully negotiated and successfully implemented uh, international environmental agreements. But there's actually no reason to assume that this will work uh, for climate. So, on that pessimistic note, uh, we're going to end. And I'll see you guys um, next Tuesday.